Should I say thank you, Pastor Morel? Pastor Morel. Thank you. And a pleasant Lord's Day morning to all the saints at Pegwell Community Church. Hallelujah. And I can say the church in the heart of the community with the community in their hearts. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm delighted to have my wife with me today, but she said she just wanted to be um, seen and not heard. So, Yes. With you, as your pastor just said, I'm one of family, and I consider myself family. Your pastor, male pastor, has been a very long friend of mine and female pastor has been a very long friend of my wife. Nurses together over many, many years, as was said. Praise God. I certainly enjoyed your worship yes 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 and those songs are they were so very appropriate so very appropriate places you on victory street reminds you that you live on victory street just so encouraging and strengthening and heart lifting. So very beautiful. This morning, I'd like to share concerning the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. And incidentally, quite a few of your songs, the worship was just geared towards the sovereignty of God. I'm just going to breathe a 20 seconds prayer and then we are going to move. So, Father, thank you again for the privilege of being in your presence. Thank you for your word, which is not only light, but it's life. And we thank you for the entrance of your word. So, Lord, we submit ourselves to you our wills to you. We submit to the direction of the Holy Spirit and we say, bless your word unto our hearts and glorify your name in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. and amen. Yes, the sovereignty of God. And the first thing I would like you to do with me is to repeat a short verse that I learned many, many years ago. So I want you to say this here with me. God 
God is in charge. Though men may say not so. God is in charge. The heavens declare it so. The universe's splendor speaks of his sovereignty. He is God of all creation, in charge of you and me. All right, yeah. I learned that somebody taught me that when I was about maybe 20 or 21 years old. God is in charge, though men may say not so. God is in charge, the heavens declare it so. The universe's splendor speaks of his sovereignty. He is God of all creation. He's in charge of you and you and you and you and you and me. Amen. I believe that this thought or theme is extremely vital for our present generation. For every Christian of today, you must have it ringing in your ears. It must be the recurring thing in your heart that God is in charge that God is sovereign, that he is the big boss man. We need to have that every day of our lives. So, I'll be sharing primarily of God's sovereignty over nations. And so I'm going to be helped by the technical team. I'm going to request the first portion of scripture, Genesis 15 verses 1 to 14. Genesis 15, 1 to 14. And we are going to be having a little journey concerning the sovereignty of your God. You will not have any shadow of a doubt that your God is in control of every situation, the biggest and the smallest. And because you will observe how God is big in all the big stuff, you will be cemented or secured with a confidence a strong confidence that your sovereign God will take care of the smallest details in your life, the minutest details in your life. So let's look at these scriptures. And God was speaking to the father of faith. At this point in time, Abram. So after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, 
Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliza of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou wilt be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it as to him as for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that thou hast Though that I shall inherit it. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a pigeon, young pigeon. And he took them unto him, all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abraham drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Please take note of this. This prophecy. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. Okay, we will have another scripture, Exodus 9, 13 to 16. But beloved, the sovereign God, the God of heaven and earth, was telling Abraham, Abraham, because I am sovereign, I am looking down the corridors of time. And I will tell you what is going to happen to your generation called the Israelites. A time is going to come in the future when they are going to be enslaved and they are going to be in bondage for 400 years. God was speaking of what was going to happen in Egypt and he was giving Abraham a preview but in the fact of God dispensing that knowledge, he was revealing to Abraham, I am the sovereign God. I see the future. I am the past. I am the present. You can trust me. My word is true. Whatever I say, it comes to pass. 
So at the appointed time, and we are now going to read Exodus 9, 13 to 16. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, excuse me, <clears throat> and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed, for this cause I have raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. What was God saying? God was saying, Pharaoh, I'm going to start with you. I have raised you up to demonstrate my sovereignty, my total control in the universe. This information is going to spread far and wide. It will go through all of the inhabited earth. And people will begin to know that there's a sovereign God and that he reigns, he rules, he's the God of Israel. And he can be your God too. But I have raised up Pharaoh with a stubborn heart. A man who is going to say, I don't know God. I don't know the God of Israel. I don't respect him. Who is he? But God was saying, when I'm finished with him, he will know who I am. He will know who I am. Every one of you, I believe, you're acquainted with the plagues of Egypt, the judgments that came upon Egypt, how God was flexing his spiritual muscles so that Israel would know that they serve a great and a big and a wonderful God. That the God they serve is the sovereign God. Sovereign God. Let's move on to another reference and we're going to look a bit at Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 24, first of all, verse 1, and then verses 4 to 6. We are looking at the sovereignty of God. Who reigns, beloved? Who rules? 
beloved? Who is always in control? It is the sovereign God. It is your sovereign God. Jeremiah. Twenty-four verses one and verses four to six. And Jeremiah is saying, the Lord showed me. He's having a vision. And behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After Nebuchadnezzar, that, after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. And the princes of Judah were the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah. Thank you. Whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Let's pause a moment. Let's pause there a moment. Now, God gave Jeremiah a vision of figs. There were two types of figs. One, God said, was good figs, very good. And the other was bad figs, very bad, that could not have been eaten. Because God is sovereign, God determines to use situations and circumstances. God turns what might look as if it's bad, he turns it to something good. That's the reason why the Bible says, all things happen or work for good to those who are the called of God, to those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. Yes. And because the tech team is so familiar with the word of God, they knew to switch to Romans 8, 28 in a flash. Yes, they're always on the ball. Thank you. Let's go back to Jeremiah 24 at this time. So notice, like these good figs, God is saying, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah to the land of the Chaldeans, to Babylon. So God is saying, it might seem strange to you, but these persons whom I am allowing to be taken as captives to Babylon, taken into captivity, I liken them, God says, to good figs. It's a strange thing. Sometimes what might look like very funny, unpredictable, hurting, or bad, it is something that God is describing as good. And you need to see this because this is a part of God's sovereignty. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come up to Judah and to take the people away captive. But that happened because they were behaving bad. 
they had turned away from God as a nation. But God decided that he would extract certain, the captives from Judah, plant them in Babylon. And God says, they are good figs. I am doing this for their good. Are you seeing this? So sometimes God might put you in a situation. You are saying, God, this is so uncomfortable. Lord, I don't like it here. It's not nice. I am seeing a lot of ugliness. A lot of unfair treatment is being meted out to me. But God is saying, you're in the right place. That's where I want you. That's where I want you. Let's read on a little further. Verse 6. Look at the positive where God is speaking. God says, for I will set mine eyes upon them for good. They are going to be in captivity. They are going to be away from the land. They are going to be in foreign territory. But God says, my eyes are going to be upon them for good. So it's not how you see through your eyes or the devil's eyes, but you have to look through God's eyes. And God says further, I will bring them again to this land. Again, God is giving a promise concerning his people. So God is reminding us. He's the sovereign God. God is saying, I'm the sovereign God. I rule. I do what I like. I'm in control. Read on. God is speaking. And God says, I will build them. God says, I will build them and not pull them down. God says, I will plant them. Now, God was speaking of how he was going to bless his people in a foreign land. Are you with me? God can bless you in your own land and God can bless you in a foreign land. Why? Because he's a sovereign God. All the lands belong to him. Whether it's a dry land, it's a wet land, it's a far off land, it's a near land, whatever the land, God is sovereign. All the lands belong to him. The Egyptian land, and the Babylonian land. Let's read on. We got another verse there. I don't think we reached verse, uh, verse 6. We did reach verse 6. Okay, 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 right. Yes, okay, fine. Verse 7, okay, good. That's another, yeah. I will give them a heart to know me. That I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. So God was giving this promise to his people. They were going to be in Babylon, but God was saying, I am in charge of Babylon. Are you with me? You need to know that. 
God is in charge of Barbados, irrespective of whatever happens. He's in charge of the Caribbean, irrespective of whatever happens. He's in charge of the whole world, irrespective of whatever happens. God is in charge. He's in charge. Let's read chapter 25, verse, we go from verse maybe what, 1 to 8? Or we'll just take up. Okay, bless God. Notice, we just re we'll read just verse 1, then we'll just jump to verse 8, or verse 7 and 8. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Skip to verse 7. Yeah. Now, God was saying the reason. He was saying, I spoke to my people. They did not hear. He said, yet have ye not hearkened unto me, said the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Verse 8. Therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words. Verse 9. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, said the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now, please take note of those words. I don't know who put it in there. I don't know who put it in there. My servant. No, no, no. No, you're, you're right, right spot. But I see it. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Is God speaking? Is God speaking? What does he say? My servant. God, you, you sure? You sure that's where you wanted Jeremiah to write? My servant? You call him Nebuchadnezzar your servant? Yes, 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 yeah. Because God can use whoever he wills. Whoever he wills in the universe. He can use Nebuchadnezzar and he can use anybody else. Yeah. Because he's sovereign. He's a sovereign God. He's a sovereign God. Look at chapters. Skip to chapter 27. We're going to move from verses 1 to 6. Or rather 1 to 7. Chapter 27, 1 to 7. In the beginning of the year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came the word of this, this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus said the Lord to me, Make these bonds and yokes and put them upon thy neck and send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, and to the king of Zedon by the hand of messengers which come to Jerusalem from Zedekiah, king of Judah. Send these yokes to all these kings and command them to say unto their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Thus shall ye say unto your masters, Tell that message to your kings. God is speaking. I have made the earth, man and beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whomsoever it seemed meet or right unto me to give it. And now have I given 
all these lands into the hand of who was her name? Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar! The king of Babylon! Was that my servant? You sure my glass is working? My servant. So God calls him again his servant? My servant. And God is saying that he is putting, giving all those kings into the hands, in the domain of Nebuchadnezzar. He's really got to be the sovereign God. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. Wonder of wonder, mystery of mysteries. But he's the sovereign God. And all nations, yes, go back there. And all nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson. Notice, notice that until, until the very time of his land shall come. And then, and then, many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. They're going to eat him raw. God is saying, I, I am going to give Nebuchadnezzar a time to reign and to rule and to be and to act like if he is in charge, like if he runs things and he calls the shots. But when his time, the sovereign God has a timetable for every ruler. You heard what I just said? The sovereign God has a timetable for every ruler. He sets up and he pulls down because he's the sovereign God. So he says, when Nebuchadnezzar's time would have been fulfilled, then I'm going to allow him to be eaten. He's going to be ravished. He made persons his prey. Now it's going to be his turn to become prey. All right. And it shall come to pass that the nation and the kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, they are going to be scattered. They'll be scattered. So God was setting the framework. Those who came under Nebuchadnezzar's rule at that point in time, the good figs, God would preserve them. But let me share this other piece of information. Unknowing, unknown to Nebuchadnezzar, when God carried the Jews, those Jews, into his land, Daniel and company, Nebuchadnezzar did not know what was about to hit him. Are you hearing me? Nebuchadnezzar did not know what was about to hit him. Because God was planting in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, God was planting some supernatural dynamos, supernatural giants. He was planting some world-changing.
changes. God was planning some change, planting some change agents who would eventually cause the laws of Babylon to be changed. Bring the despot to their knees. We're going to read a few of those verses. We're going to read a few of them. Let me share a few of those with you. And then we're going to... Daniel 4. Daniel, Daniel 2, first of all. 4 to 7. Daniel 2, 4 to 7. Then we're going to shift to Daniel 4. 34 to 37. So Daniel 2, 4 to 7. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth, it is that your God is the God of gods and the, and the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. In Babylon, God, was, God began to exalt Daniel. The wise men of Babylon, the Obia men of Babylon, all the soothsayers, they could not interpret the dream. But a Jew, an Israelite, captive, received the interpretation from his God. And so in Babylon, these words were being released. The king of Babylon was now saying, he was confessing. Just switch back to 47. He was declaring in Babylon that the God of the Jews is the real deal. He's the God of gods. He's the Lord of kings. He's a revealer of secrets. He was being distinguished. He was being set apart. He was being placed in the category that he rightly deserves. Far and far and far above every name that is named, every God that is named, every power that is named, because he is bigger than big. He is greater than great. He is more colossal than colossal. That's the God you are serving, you know. That's the God you're serving. He is your God. He is your God. Let's get another verse there. Move to Daniel chapter 6, 25 to 28. Twenty-five to twenty-eight. Now, this is move ahead a bit. This is this is where the Babylonians. Well, we're we going to come back to that. I'm going to show you how the the Babylonians were overthrown, kicked out at the appointed time. But the riots. His name, some might say, is a, similar to Cyrus. But anyhow, he was now reigning over Babylon. He was in charge. He opened the Babylonian empire. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and this had to do with after, with Daniel's, you know, out of the lion story and that, that thing. Right. 
that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear. Men tremble and fear before. He was, God planted those boys there to rock every hellish foundation. Yes. Nebuchadnezzar thought he had captives when he took them away. But he did not know that the Babylonians were now being made captive by this dynamic superheroes. And Daniel and his friends. So when the power of God was made manifest, it is said, Darius, he says, for he declare he is the living God and he is steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Darius is receiving revelation. He has received revelation about the king of heaven, the God of heaven, the sovereign God, that his kingdom was not going to end. It was going to be forever. He says, therefore, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble, men fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, steadfast forever, and his kingdom, which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be ever unto the end. Yes, that was happening in Babylon. That was happening in Babylon. He delivered and rescued, and he worked signs and wonders in heaven and in the earth. Who had delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. That's the same God you were serving. Daniel's God is your God. I said, Daniel's God is your God. Same God. He was the God of Babylon. He overthrew Babylon. Darius was the king of Media and Persia. Let's go to Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. I'm going to pass over the chapter, but I'm just going to give you a gist of it because I believe you know it well. But at this time, Belshazzar, son of Nebuchadnezzar, was reigning. And Belshazzar had decided that he was going to take some of the sacred vessels that were taken from the house of God and carried to Babylon. And he was going to have a party. And he and his servants would drink wine in those sacred vessels. And so while they were doing that and having their party, in verse 7, I think, of this chapter, I think a hand was seen writing on the wall, mini, mini, tekel, you far sin. Yes, thanks for the interpretation, verse This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. 
Tikal, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Pures, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And, beloved, that very night, I need to get a verse for you, that very night. Verse 30, verse 30. In that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. That very night that they were having the party time, They were celebrating to the gods of silver and the gods of gold, etc., etc. The handwriting was seen. They could not interpret it, but Daniel did. But that was the end. It said the Medes and the Persians, they found a way to divert the waters. The waters that flowed through Babylon diverted so that there was dry land. They made a land bridge. And so they entered. So while the party was going on, other stuff was going on even before. God had a thing set up. So that very night, Belshazzar came to his end. And the Medes and the Persians took over. God says, it's time for me as the sovereign God to give rulership and dominion to somebody else. Because God says, I run things in heaven. And I run things upon planet earth. And I give it to whomsoever I will at whatever point in time. I will. So let's, let's begin to wrap up. Begin, begin to wrap up. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 22 and 23. And then Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 7. So, I said earlier, the name Darius, Cyrus, there might be some interchange, some similarity with rulership. But here, and this is also recorded in one of the in Isaiah also. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. God stirred up his spirit. God injected his spirit. God injected something in this man's spirit. God put some thoughts in his head. And he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom. And he also put it in writing. Thus said Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth had the Lord God of heaven given me. And he had charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of his people? The Lord his God be with him. And let him go up. All right. Let him go up and build. But thanks, this is where we want. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, 
the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and he put it also in writing. Thus said Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven had given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he had charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Okay. All right, go to chapter 3, verse 7. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters, meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. May I say, beloved, that Cyrus, this man, this Iranian, modern-day Iranian, because Persia was all Iran, But he financed, he financed the building project. He supplied lots of materials for the building of the house of God. Are you hearing me? God caused this man, and he said, look, all of you Jews who want to go back home and build up your city, I give you the freedom, 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 and I will provide protection. I will give you protection. I will give you the materials you need. It will be financed from my kingdom because God is sovereign. He's a sovereign God and he is your God. Coming down to a close. Maybe two more scriptures. Second Kings chapter 5. I'll probably just read one verse or two. Verse one or two. Second Kings chapter five. We'll just read verse one. Just verse one we'll take. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Israel, Somebody correct me now. Oh, Syria. Thank you. I was waiting for the correction. Syria. Syria. Was that a Christian country? Were they Christians? Syria? I think they always used to be attacking Israel. Huh? I think they were most always at war with Israel. Syria. Okay. Let me see what it says. Was a great man with his master, meaning his king. Syrian general to give victories. Is that what is written there? God, you ain't carrying this thing too far. Huh? My, you singing out Syrian generals and giving them victories? Yeah. God said, yeah. I, I, give, I give him victory. I give Naaman victories. And let me tell you something. Naaman wasn't even aware as to where his victories were coming from. He wasn't even sure who was giving him these victories. All he knew that when he went into battle, 
Man, he was getting victory after victory after victory. He was singing like what we, what we sang. Victory is mine, victory is mine. Huh? But it was God who was giving him victory. Victory. But you know what God was saying? I am not only the God of Israel. I am the God of Syria also. I am the God of Syria. And just perchance you tend to forget, God says, I am the God of the whole earth. And I can give victory to whomsoever I will at whatever point in time I will. And you are my children, and I'm going to give victory to you. You've been singing it. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Beloved, I am reinforcing victory is yours. It is yours. It is yours. Final scripture, Matthew 17, 24 to 27. Matthew 17, 24 to 27. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that receive tribute money, the tax collectors, came to Peter and said, Hey, Peter, hey, Pete, does your master pay taxes? Peter said unto him, Oh, just go back a bit there. Oh, yeah, right. Does your master pay taxes? Should we? Fine, thank you. Verse 25, yeah, go ahead. He said, yes. Yeah, yeah, my, part, my master pay taxes. And when he came into the house, Jesus addressed him. He said, Pete, what you thinking, boy? Uh, Pete said, as a matter of fact, yeah, Jesus didn't give him time to respond yet, but he asked him, what are you thinking? But he said, tell me this. Of whom does the kings of the earth take, let me say taxes, of their own children, their own people, or strangers? And Pete says, of strangers, Lord. And Jesus said, well, then your children are free. Verse 27, notwithstanding, just so that we don't cause any offense to the authorities, go down by the sea. Make sure you carry your fishing hook. Cast your fishing hook in the sea. Take up the first fish that bites and you hook him. And when thou hast opened his mouth, you will find a piece of money inside the fish mouth. Take that and go and pay your taxes and pay my taxes. Amen. Thank you. Beloved, God is concerned of the big things, and he's concerned of the small things. If you do not have a local assembly, feel free to join us for an exhilarating time of worship. Our services are Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening 
Healing and Deliverance at 6.30 p.m. Join us in prayer on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and for Bible study on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Bless fellowship and enjoy. The simplicity of